So, buenos dias. Good morning. I hope your batteries are all charged. So, I'm Helen from Usport Trust International, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this masterclass. I hope you're all in the right one, the fundamentals of a healthy childhood. We've got a lot to get through, so I hope you're feeling really energized. A few basic key facts I'm sure you're already aware. 80% of adolescents worldwide are not being physically active for the recommended 60 hours, 60 hours, 60 minutes a day, one hour a day. And that situation is actually getting worse. So in this masterclass, we're go going to delve into why physical activity is such an important factor in tackling and preventing non-communicable diseases like obesity and type 2 diabetes. We've got an awful lot to get through in a, in a short time. We have a guest keynote speaker, we have a panel of experts, and then, of course, we want you to get involved too. So, let's get started. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce Gregor Stark, He's a lecturer at the Faculty of Sport in Ljubljana, Slovenia. And I know, because I've heard him before, you'll have to go a long way to find anyone who is as passionate about physical activity and providing equal opportunities and access to young people to all be physically active. Over to you, Gregor. Thank you very much. Does it work? Is it on? <laughs> yeah, OK. Just click. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing, well. you're doing well, you slept well. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. Not about Helen, not about me. <laughs> <laughs> we are friends. This is the story we need, yeah? I'm going to get out of the way. Um, but I'm going to tell you not a children's story, but a story about children, about giving and taking. What happens when we give something to children and when we, when we take something from children, and if we change something in their environment. So, we want them to be smiling. I, I don't know if the, if the title is correct, because I'm not sure that every child is smiling today. So, how to make them smiling probably would be a better uh, title. But, one month and ten years ago, we, we finished our fifth round of the, of the ACDSI study. This is analysis of children's development in Slovenia. We are doing it since 1970s. So every 10 years in the same 11 locations. And in 2013, we asked them about their physical activity at a sedentary time. And we found out that they sit for 75 minutes on average in after school time, in the afternoon at home, uh, doing scrolling on, 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 on internet, you know, playing video games, being on smartphones, etc. Also reading is included in that sitting time, because it is a sedentary activity. And we asked them about how many minutes you've been moderately and vigorously physically active. And we found out that it was 140 minutes. It's a lot in comparison to the 60 minutes that the recommendations are talking about. I'm sorry, some, maybe some people won't agree with me, but 60 minutes is a joke. Even obese children in Slovenia are more active than 60 minutes a day. No, we have the data. Um, but then, of course, being a child is different, today is different than yesterday, and we finished our sixth round of ACDSI study a month ago. And this is what showed. So the physical activity part only decreased for 10 minutes. It's not so bad in, I mean, when you think about all the things that are happening, you know. But when you look at the sedentary time, it's awful. You know. And this is only the sedentary time at home. We are not counting in the four to five hours of sitting in schools. You know? So <laughs> the, it's, it's much bigger. So. This is a different environment. We've been changing children's environment, and we basically, we don't understand children. Our childhood was different. 
We didn't grow up with all this technology. And we cannot blame the parents for it, because the parents are the, the white lab rabbits. You know, we are the one learning for the first generation how to bring up children with all of this around us. So, what was happening to our environment? This is the data about physical fitness of Slovenian children from 1988, and it shows until 2010 on this slide. What was going on? The, the blue line are the boys, the orange line are the girls. So you can see that in the beginning, from 19, late 1980s and early 90s, we had a big improvement in physical fitness. Why? Because in previous years, we were, we were building a lot of sport infrastructure. So every school in Slovenia has two gyms, one small, one big, outdoor playgrounds. Uh, some have swimming pools, some have, most of them have athletic tracks. So we have probably the most equipped schools in the world when it comes to sport facilities. Very well equipped, you know. And we were also heavily investing in quality physical education. Educating physical education teachers, uh, we, we made a new PE curriculum that gives a lot of competences to, to children. So we were improving it. But the devil, you know, in the early 90s, computers came to our homes. And afterwards, gaming consoles, smartphones, uh, TV programming for children with hundreds and hundreds of programs, you know. So you can see the internet use in Slovenia. In 1997, our, uh, our families started getting internet. 1997, physical fitness started declining. So it's a, it's a nice picture to see what's going on, you know, when, when children start sitting instead of moving around. So, we had a problem. Houston, what to do? We've been struggling with policymakers for, for decades to do something about it. They, you know, you feed them data. It's like feeding a small child, you know. Open your mouth, feed in, chew. You know, they chew on it. Sometimes they swallow. Most of the time they spit out. You know, this is how policymakers work, you know. And we were very lucky because in 2010, we had the meeting at the ministry, not about this, about something else. And they told us, you know, we have 10 million, dollar, uh, 10 million euros from European social funding, and we don't know how to spend them. Wow, you don't? We do, you know. So we said, okay, you can't use this for the programs, but what you can do, you can employ freshly graduated physical education teachers in schools, but in this case, the school has to provide two or three extra hours of physical education for children per week. So children went from three hours to five hours a week. And this was 30,000 children. And immediately, even the first year, nothing showed yet, but afterwards, you know, the physical fitness started improving. And you can see in 2018, our girls were at the highest point ever, much fitter than the mothers. So emancipation in sport and physical education for girls in Slovenia is excellent. Our girls are super, super fit, have been super, super fit before COVID. Um, and the boys were doing also good. I mean, they were close to the level of their fathers. So we were making improvements. Of course, boys were much more affected by this than girls. Okay, we said we are on the right path, but then the, runny, the money ran out. Uh, the government promised to continue this, but they couldn't find the money to finance it further. So in, in uh, 2019, it, it was off. You can see that healthy lifestyle included all children. We didn't segregate them by being obese or non-obese, being fit or non-fit. We just wanted everybody to come in, regardless of who they are, what they are, how they look like. So you can see what happened to the children with normal weight, with healthy weight, and children with overweight. They both improved. The blue lines are the ones who were included, and the, the orange ones, the ones who were not included, in the same schools, in the same environment. So you could see the effect of having extra curricular time uh, for, for physical activity. And then the COVID came. This is what happened. Don't say poor Slovenian children. 
because it was the same in your countries. You just don't know it because you don't have the data. We've been measuring children immediately after the first lockdown, after the second lockdown. And this is the picture. The boys are at the lowest point ever. The girls are also very, very low. So we knew that we are facing a long time of recovery. And the next year, the next two years, <coughs> things did improve because schools were open again for the entire year. And it, it improved somehow, but this year it stopped improving. I mean, it, it flattened out. The curve is flattening out. So we won't come up here if we don't do anything. Why is this improving? Also because affected children are leaving the educational system because they're finishing school and children from kindergarten are coming in and they were not as affected during COVID as other children. So it's a natural thing that things will improve eventually. But those children who have been affected are going to stay affected for the rest of their lives. So they were leaving the educational system with 16% lower physical fitness than any generation before. It's horrible. Because usually we were looking at maybe 1%, 1.5% oscillation from year to year. Immediately we had 16% in one year. So this is what happened with overweight in population. So overweight in boys went up for 21% during COVID. 21%. It's terrible. Really. This is the biggest social experiment of modern times. The governments are responsible for it. What did any government in Europe do about it? Nothing. We are shutting our eyes from the really big problem. And what's happening now? The obesity normalized. So if you look at, at, at obesity rates, at overweight rates, we are on the same level as before COVID. And we say, yeah, fine, that's great. No, it's not. Because BMI really fell down but the triceps skin fault, the fat mass didn't go down. So this means the children of today, they are not fitter. <coughs> they are regulating their weight by not eating. So this is why I'm so critical about nutrition, 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 nutrition all the time. It should be movement, movement, movement. Also all the documents, documents on global documents on nutrition and physical activity. It's like 87 pages of nutrition and two pages of physical activity. This is wrong. We cannot eat much more than our, our other children of our age ate before, but we, considerably, we move considerably less. So this is what I wanted to show you. What, what happens if you give additional physical activity to children and if you take it away? It all reflects on their development. And you know, we have to be very careful of what we are doing. So, it's very important to, to have knowledge about this, to use this knowledge, and to, to have children use this knowledge, because knowledge really can move things, and fun can move the children. And if you have knowledge, the fun alone won't help it. But if children have knowledge, if their fun is pointed somewhere, then you can have progress. You know? And I hope we'll, we'll have the opportunity to move both of them. And I hope that all of you are going to join this fight because it's a very unfair fight. We are fighting multi-million dollar industry of technology, uh, internet applications, social media, you know, and we are really crusaders in that regard, you know. So our, our struggle will be long and hard, but we have to do it for the children. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gregor. Gregor's not going anywhere. Please take a seat. He's joining, he's joining our uh, panel. Okay, so now we'll move on to the panel phase, and it's my great opportunity to introduce our panel of experts. So, Bruno, please come and join us. Bruno Hellman is uh, from Brazil. And he's the manager for the Kids and Diabetes in Schools project at the International Diabetes Foundation. Next, Patty, please come and join us. Patty Scholten is from the Netherlands, and Patty is the manager of YOG, I might not pronounce that correctly, YOG, Healthy Youth, Healthy Future. And Laura, Laura Lorenzo is from Spain and she's the Head of Communications and Marketing at the Gazol Foundation. So, 
quick warm-up question to get you going. I'm going to try and sit on this without falling off it, which would be very embarrassing. Um, so from your perspective, each of you, 60 seconds, tell us what do you think are the fundamentals of a healthy childhood? And let's start with Bruno. Thank you, Helen. So I think the fundamentals of uh, a healthy and happy childhood, especially for those who live with a non-communicable disease, uh, like I am living with type 1 diabetes, we need to create environments, especially schools, that make sure that uh, know how to treat and include the students. But most of that, uh, treat those students as same as other students so we don't, we don't generate uh, stigma and discrimination. And the way uh, to do that is by providing uh, capacitations to school staff and teachers, but also teaching and uh, sharing with students' peers about diabetes and about the main symptoms and also how they, they can prevent uh, severe episodes such as like hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Thank you, Bruno. Patty, same question to you. Yeah, I think it's fundamental for me that we create a healthier environment because the impact of our environment is huge on our lifestyles. And I think we as professions of professionals, we need to, um, to change it from obesogenic, as it is right now, more to an environment that encourages people to be active and to make healthy food choice, to relax, to rest, uh, etc. And we need to, we cannot do this, this alone, so we need all stakeholders with us, so make it fun that they join your movement. Thank you. And Laura? From the Gazelle Foundation, the, the fundamentals of a healthy childhood are based on four pillars, which are physical activity, but also healthy eating, sleep, and well-being. And I want to highlight this holistic approach that we use, and it is uh, fundamented on the scientific evidence, which demonstrate that these are the four determinants of, uh, of a healthy childhood to prevent childhood obesity and other non-communicable diseases. And just to highlight this uh, fundamental component, I would like to say that in our programs, we work on these four pillars and we do it through the pedagogical metaphor of the healthy galaxy, which is uh, a galaxy that is composed of four planets, and these four planets correspond to these four pillars. So in our programs, we work with families, and we start symbolically a space journey through this healthy galaxy to discover these healthy habits, and the mission uh, of the kids and families is uh, to bring these healthy habits back to planet Earth. So we follow always the motto, make it healthy and make it fun. Thank you, Laura. We'll, we'll come back to delve a bit more into, into the other pillars. It's not just physical activity that has to be, be factored in for a healthy childhood. Gregor, I'll give the last word to yeah, you. Thank you. <laughs> I would say giving children the opportunity to be active, to move, but not alone, not in isolation, uh, to give them an opportunity to, to play with friends, to play outdoors. We are struggling very hard to have a new curriculum with five hours of mandatory physical education per week and have at least two hours of outdoor physical education. So we want to bring children back to nature because only in that way they are going to respect nature because this will be their environment. At the moment, it's not. The nature is not their environment. We saw that during COVID, you know, when they were at home, they, were not, they didn't know how to use the forest. They didn't know how to use the trees because they, they never climbed them before <laughs> you know this is why physical fitness went down the home is not fit to do that you know so i'd say these are very important things also for the mental health you know and uh teaching them how to respect others how to be compassionate how to be respectful um, this is this can be taught through physical activity through play um, and also 
when you're thinking about physical activity, you maybe remember your physical education teachers, you know, being like in the military, but it's not like that anymore. I mean, at least not in Slovenia, you know. So we are trying to, for children to, to learn in play. It's, it's very hard to do for the, for the teacher because the teacher has to take the work very serious. But, you know, the, the best teachers are the ones who teach in a way the children don't know that they learn anything, that they're just playing. And then at the end, you know, wow, I know how to do this. So this is something that, that we need to give to, to children. We, we rob them of many things, you know, we our generations, adults, and, and our parents, you know, already. So we have to give something back, you know, so give them the opportunity to, to develop, as, as, at least as, as well as we did, if not better. Thank you, Bruno. I've noticed, maybe you noticed too, Gregor never, I should have said Gregor, Gregor never stops moving. <laughs> He's always on the ball moving. Um, let, let, let me come back to you, um, Bruno, with something that you touched on in your first answer. You mentioned that the stigma that children can feel. How can we change public perception about non-communicable diseases and ensure that, that children don't feel embarrassed or, or that they can't take, take part? What, what can we do to, to, to change that? Of course, there's no uh, major change uh, without uh, public policies. But I would say that each and every uh, person in this room has a responsibility when uh, talking and discussing uh, NCDs, uh, utili utilizing a non uh, stigmatization uh, wording. So, for example, uh, instead of using diabetic or uh, obese, just like put the person or the people first, because we, and I include myself on, on this case because I live with uh, NCD, I come first before, I, c I can before my, my condition. So I think that the first step uh, to fight and combat the stigma is uh, to reflect and to adapt the usage of language. Thank you. And, and Laura, I know you're a, a communications expert. Maybe, maybe there's something you'd like to, to add to that? Yes, first of all, and just to give a little bit of context, the Adegazol Foundation, we have the mission to prevent childhood obesity through the promotion of healthy habits. And we work to reduce the stigma of obesity that unfortunately is associated with bullying based on uh, body image. And I was going to share some recommendations from the World Obesity Federation. One of them is just the one that uh, Bruno already mentioned. And I would also like to add in terms of image or First, in terms of language, I would say that when talking about obesity, it's very important to reinforce the idea that obesity is a very complex and multifactorial reality. Uh, just to try to avoid to put the blame in the individual. Uh, that unfortunately, it's a widespread misconception yet. So we have to reinforce this uh, complex and multifactorial reality. And in terms of image, I would like to also add that we have to avoid to portray uh, people affected with obesity as people uh, which are normally look sad or are isolated from other people or have sedentary behaviors because with this kind of images we are perpetuating a stereotype so just introducing little nuances little changes we can do a lot to reduce stigma Thanks, Laura. And, and let me stay with you. Um, we're focusing on, on the fun piece today. So how is the Gazol Foundation bringing the fun into your program? Yes, uh, as I said before, uh, we follow the motto, uh, make it healthy, make it fun. It is also very linked to what uh, Gregor said before. Uh, but we want to uh, convey that idea that healthy habits are fun, that they are uh, in fashion, so that uh, we uh, make more easy that uh, children adopt these healthy habits. And how do we have this fun? So we use uh, physical activity, movement, and play, which is the best way to learn, uh, as, it, as we were mentioning before. And... Uh, the most important thing is just uh, to try to evoke emotions and to awaken the intrinsic motivation towards healthy habits. That motivation that comes from inside 
and uh, then um, doesn't need this external reward or incentive. So we have to, to play with this. Uh, another point that I would like to highlight is the, the key role of families. In all our programs, we work not just with children, but also with uh, parents, mothers, uh, fathers, or adult caregivers, as we know that they are uh, very powerful influencers for kids. And we try to promote family bondings uh, which is really important to contribute to the well-being of children and to the consolidation of healthy habits at home. I would also like to highlight that our programs uh, are low barrier, which uh, leverage inclusive physical activity to reduce uh, social inequalities and also gender inequalities, among others. In, in terms of the gender, the, reduc the reduction of gender inequalities, uh, it's important the fun component and the social component of physical activities. Uh, we know that uh, girls appreciate this dimension over, for example, the competitivity of certain sports or uh, physical activities. So we have to focus on that. And we have a wide uh, range of uh, sports disciplines. We can uh, explore other cooperative uh, models that move away from the competitive goal of, or of just winning or losing. So we have to explore this to try to reduce uh, the sedentarism rates. And just uh, to finish, I would like to also stand out that in all our programs, we measure everything we do and we follow scientific methodology. So uh, we, in other programs, we have a study protocol which defines uh, the objective of that program, the population sample we are working with, the variables we are going to study, and the methodology, which includes an evaluation, uh, a pre-intervention evaluation, and a post uh, uh, intervention evaluation, and we also work with an uh, intervention group and a control group, and all this allows us to uh, study and to, to have the, the results of the impact of our project on the um, healthy habits of children and families. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Let me turn to you, Patty. So we, we've heard about the, the approach taken by the, the Gazel Foundation. I know at YOG you, you take a holistic approach as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, maybe first uh, a bit of the definition of a holistic approach. I think it's good to stress three things. Um, we are not only focusing on physical activity and movement, but we are also focusing on uh, healthy food, so not really the candy that's on the table. <laughs> and we are uh, <laughs> focusing on um, uh, stress reduction and uh, sleeping well and drinking water. That's our, our main topics. And maybe the, the second thing is that um, uh, our approach is based on the principle of health in all policies. So um, it's very good to uh, imagine that also non-health policies are very important and have a signi significant impact on our well-being and our health. So um, let's take health into account also in other kind of policies. And uh, the third thing is that we cannot do this alone. So you need to involve other stakeholders. So also people maybe from urban planning or uh, people from education, uh, they can help you uh, uh, with making the environment more uh, fiscal friendly. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to set you all a bit of a challenge now. So if I was to give you all one minute, what would be your call to action to, to our great audience? Or what would be the piece of advice that you would give to everyone to take away when they go back home? And Shall I make it? Yeah, you go. Yes. I want to challenge you to think of one stakeholder that's not really involved in your community or your profession, but that can make a difference. So who's the first one you're going to drink uh, coffee with when you're home? <laughs> Gregor. Yeah, I would work on that and uh, also think about who's the key one you have to have coffee with. You know, usually you need a rich uncle. Because eventually you need, you need funding, <laughs> you know. So 
think very wisely uh, and and strategically, you know. So you probably know many people, you know. Just use this network, you know, to to get to the persons, to talk to them, to try to persuade them, you know. Try. I mean, the best solution would be to talk to the financial minister of your country. You know, this would be the best <laughs> one. Yeah. But otherwise, as as parents, I can give you an advice as a parent as well. Uh, my philosophy of bringing up my children and other children is that a happy child has to be uh, tired every day, has to be hungry every day, um, has to be sleepy every day, and has to be happy every day. And you can do this with physical activity. You know, my children in the evening are so tired that they go to sleep and they sleep very, very well. I don't have to worry about <laughs> the problem of bad sleeping you know thank you i love that happy every day hungry every day sleepy every day it's great bruno so follow that <laughs> as a an amateur athlete who is passionate about long distance endurance uh i'll bring ch three challenges because one is not enough <laughs> so we'll, we'll let you <laughs> <laughs> so the first one uh, would be to everyone to check uh, the kids resource at the Congress app. We uploaded a PDF with uh, a bit of uh, the kids, which stands for Kids and Diabetes Schools Program. And we have uh, a bit of explanation and also some opportunities for engagement. The second challenge would be to everyone to try to reconsider and think twice before using uh, stigmatizing wording when to refer to uh, NCDs. And third, uh, but not uh, last but not least, would be that we keep in mind that there are several types of, of diabetes. Uh, some of them uh, cannot be prevented, but that doesn't mean it cannot be treated. And physical activity is a fundamental part of the treatment and care and prevention for all, f all type of diabetes. Yeah, thank you. Laura. So the final challenge. <laughs> I'm going to ask you first to stand up. Can everybody stand up? Now you can sit down. <laughs> stand up. Just introduce a fan movement, freestyle. Come on. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and now you can sit down. <laughs> well, I just wanted to convey a very simple challenge, which is to try to introduce movement, uh, movements in any opportunity that you have in your uh, daily lives. So you can lead by example just by introducing these kind of actions, maybe at work, uh, introducing active breaks at home, uh, taking advantage of that, those uh, fun moments of tidying up the house, uh, cooking, shopping, um, and maybe trying to be very mindful and choosing always the active uh, options, such as taking the stairs instead of the elevator, or uh, taking this active mode of mobility or, or transportation instead of taking the car, for example. So I just wanted to, uh, to give this idea that every movement counts. Fabulous, thank you. So I haven't had the red card on time yet, so I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. Does anyone have any questions for any members of our panel? Andreu, I think there's a mic coming your way. Well, thank, thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, what you're doing with your family. Gregor, <laughs> we have shared during the breakfast. It's the same that I'm, I'm using to do with my, with my kids. And it works, it works very well. And it's difficult to, to work with the families and to convince the parents while we're trying to through the kids. I think that uh, if we go to schools and, and make the kids activate and make the kids committed with, uh, with the healthy lifestyles, they're convincing their parents. But well, I'm also passionate about what you're doing in, 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 uh, in Dutch countries. It's incredible what you have been doing. But I have an advice for about the, who are we going to take a coffee with? Because we have to be prepared and that's our experience. And this is about strategy, business strategy, that the stakeholders, that the stakeholders will, will get engaged, like you had 10 million euros in the past, but they will get bored or they will stop funding. 
So we have to be all the time looking for new stakeholders, convince new stakeholders, and being like uh, a boxer will be fighting. So we have to make a punch here, then another one here. So yeah, <laughs> no, uh, it doesn't mean it's not about violence. It's, it's about trying to find different ways to go to different stakeholders, to get fundings or to get support with different, with, uh, with different groups, because otherwise, once when we go to a municipality and the municipality gets bored after four years of working with us, we have to see that uh, maybe <coughs> the other stakeholders of this place will get stuck with us and we will have the schools that will be working with us without the, uh, the, the municipality or without the regional government or without the, uh, let's say, uh, a foundation that is paying what, uh, what we're doing. So we will have to think about having a lot of coffees, and every day. <laughs> that, that, that was the advice. And thank you, and, and you're doing a marvelous uh, job. Thank, thank you. you. I think I would just say, as someone who's addicted to coffee and trying to drink less of it, <laughs> this could be tea or water or you know, <laughs> any, any other beverage. And just, just one example that I was aware of that happened in the UK, a school that was really looking for funding to improve their um, physical activity programs. When there was a lottery winner in their area, the head teacher found out the address, went and knocked on the door, and came away with a cheque for £20,000. So be bold. Um, any, any other comments to... Well, to uh, <laughs> You, you said that coffee is not. I mean, you said that coffee is not the only drink. I mean, I've never been drunk in my life. <laughs> uh, I confess, I've never been drunk. I started drink. My first alcohol drink was when I was 30. You know, uh, but if a financial minister is ready to get drunk with me and give the money to children, I'm prepared to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Notice, I didn't mention alcohol. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody? Yep. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Fiona Chambers from University College Cork in Ireland. Um, so my question is around children's voice. And it's around where are the children in the development of policies and interventions? So how do you actually include them in the co-design of these things? Because in, in the work that we do, it's always with, for, and by those children. So I'd really like to hear comments from the panel on that. Thank yeah. you. Um, such, such an important question. And before I give that floor to the panel, um, I would just talk about a, a programme that uh, we've been involved in in the UK, which has been um, funded by, by Novo Nordisk. And that was around developing a, a Move for Fun programme. And for us, it was so important to engage the children in talking about the different activities that they would like to take part in. And um, one activity that blew us away, they said they wanted to take part in water polo. We would never have thought about that, but that, that was what they wanted to do. And that has been a really key factor in the programme being successful. So l let me... Patty. Yeah. Uh, what we do in the Netherlands, um, one of the pillars of our approach is shared um, shared ownership. So um, the kids should say to the local government what they need, ki what kind of playground. But because they can make a basketball court, but if the children do not like basketball in that particular area, it will not work. So we always stress that point. It's part of our approach. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, for example, in the healthy lifestyle, we didn't say what the school should do. We said, you are free to do whatever you want to do in those extra two or three hours. But as the children, what they're interested in as well. So also the teachers acknowledge the, the wishes of the children to have maybe some activities that were not covered in the curriculum. And of course, co-creation is something not very old. So this, we've been talking about co-creation for the last few years and not many policies have been exploiting this. Uh, but next year, I mean, we're starting this year, uh, we, we managed to squeeze out a couple of millions from the government again uh, for, <laughs> the, for the secondary school <laughs> children. So we are starting the co-create program with them. Uh, so 
we want to first identify what their obstacles to be physically active are, what they want to do, and then try to find a solution and make programs that would work for them. So this is one of the first like a big project that we, are, we will try to, to implement. Gregor, I need to spend more time with you. How do you just squeeze a few million? <laughs> I've been trying to do that for years. <laughs> Bruno. So the International Diabetes Federation uh, works by the principle of meaningful involvement and f meaningful engagement of uh, people with lived experience. And by lived experience, we not only include those who have the diagnose of diabetes, but also the care partners, the care supporters. Uh, for us, it's uh, a principle that we include those people from uh, the scratch till the end, so they are part of, of the whole process. Otherwise, it's just uh, tokenism and we just use them as, uh, as consultation. So for us, it's really important that we make sure that they are included throughout the whole process. And talking about specifically about children, when we first develop um, the, the kids program, we ask uh, students living with diabetes, what they were lacking, what they were like, the challenge that they were facing, so we could uh, co-create something that would address their needs. Great. Laura, did you want to add anything? Well, I would say that in the lines of uh, Gregor, uh, in all our programs, we also empower those professionals that work with kids uh, to listen to them, to listen to their preferences. Before I was also uh, speaking about the reduction of gender inequalities in the engagement in physical activities. And we also want to, to listen to the preferences. We sometimes have uh, spaces that are designed uh, following the preferences of adults. And for example, in, in cities, we can see that there are a lot of uh, basketball courts or football uh, fields, or also this model is replicated in the schools playgrounds uh, and this is not contributing to engage all, all children in physical activities so of course we have to listen to the preferences and we have to provide an environment that uh, is accessible and uh, is engaging for all kids thank you so the panel are all here for the entire conference so I'm sure you'll have more questions, but I think now is probably the right move moment to move on to co-creation as, as that topic has come up. Um, so this is where you all get involved. Um, and there are two facilitators for the um, co-creation workshop piece. So I would like to ask Mads and uh, Lydica to come up and just uh, introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Lidike Middelbeek. Uh, I'm an international consultant for the World Health Organization Regional Office for Southeast Asia, where I support the 11 member states of that region with the promotion of fiscal activity, um, uh, which is, of course, very nice, but very high over. And I think in relation to discussion, I want to take it back to actually the question that was asked at, uh, at the end, because uh, I would definitely go and have a coffee with the children, and I think we all should, coffee, not maybe, some water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, my children don't drink coffee yet. <laughs> um, because I think there's, uh, they have such important intelligence and they, we have to find out their sweet spots. What do they like? What, what kind of activities do they like? What's fun to them in general? What's their definition of fun? Uh, and we have to bring this intelligence to the table of the policy makers our tables, the professionals, everyone who's here in the room. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Mess. I am from uh, the City's Change in Diabetes Program, which is a public-private partnership trying to address some of the systemic drivers. I'm here because uh, children are humans, and it's a fundamental human right to play and be active. And I think, again, also talking about the lived experience of the children, it's super important that we account for that. So at the uh, Cities Changing Diabetes, we are trying to 
do different uh, type of programs together with a lot of partners. Um, as Helen just said, we have the Move for Fun program. I have some promotional material about it. Uh, we just we are just publishing a playbook about it. Uh, so if you like coffee, I like coffee. We can drink and uh, you can see <laughs> something about the program. Um, but we truly believe we built these challenges. So it's not something that the children decide themselves to live in a sedentary lifestyle. We can empower them, we can do a lot of things, but we also need to change the systemic drivers. Just look outside the windows. Children can't drive cars. There are cars everywhere. These are some of the issues that we need to fix so that children can be active, can play and be together. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thanks, Lydica and Mads. I've got a feeling a lot of people are going to be wanting to have coffee with Mads after this session. <laughs> so be prepared to drink a lot. Um, OK, so how is this going to work? We've got about 30 minutes now for you and us to be able to explore together the fundamentals of healthy childhood and identify ideas worth sharing. And at the end, there'll be a chance for some feedback so that you can share your ideas. So, as we say in the UK, a few Chatham House rules. Um, there's no such thing as a silly question. All questions are valid. Please feel free, everyone, to participate, contribute your ideas, share questions, answers. Um, and just, you know, show respect for each other when, when anybody's speaking. I know a fault of mine is I, I get excited and I interrupt and that's rude. So just some, just some basic um, some rules there. So three key dimensions we'd like you to focus on. I think these are on the table as well. Um, the power of communication when fighting stigma. The power of the network, the place-based and community approach. We heard Patty talk about how important that is to involve other stakeholders. And then the power of low barrier and fun-based activities, what that can really do in terms of making our children more active. So um, there's facilitators on the table. We'll all be circulating. So um, maybe just stand up, move for a moment, and then get started. <laughs>